All right, and we are live. Welcome to WHUS 91.7, and this is Stores at the top of the hour. And if you're listening to a podcast, welcome to The Way Podcast, found on all your streaming services. And today I am here with Giuseppe. Uh, please introduce yourself. Say hi, Giuseppe. Hello, I am a student at UConn, and today we're going to be talking about psychedelic drugs. Indeed. We're going to talk about acid. And basically the knowledge, well, first, why, why are you established? Uh, how, how do you know about acid? Well, um, I grew up dumb white trash. And when you're dumb <laughs> white yeah. trash, you want to, I would call it experience every level of consciousness. Uh, what they would call it is get f- as fucked up as possible in as many different ways. Um, I tried acid it was offered to me by a crazy guy um a student of yukon actually at the time i don't know that he still is um what age was this when you first i was probably 16 the first time i tried it i imagine i remember it was before i had the ability to drive nice well permit i don't even know that i had that (laughs) all right and also adding into that ethos that background knowledge so you said uh, trying all different kinds of drugs. So have you tried weed? Yes. Acid? Yes, sir. Shrooms? Yep. DMT? Indeed. Molly? Yep. Percocet? Yeah. Opioids? Opioids in general, yeah. Uh, not brand name Percocet. Okay, what about heroin? Yes. Crystal meth? I uh, Unfortunately, yes. Crack? Unfortunately, <laughs> yes. Okay, so I think that checks off the list. I mean, I'm sure I could be missing a few. Um, Ayahuasca? I think, no. I, th- I think you've <laughs> That's kinda, kind of boring. Yeah, you've kind of gotten all the usual suspects there, I imagine. Okay, so uh, safe to say, got some knowledge on the background. And we'll dive into those other topics different days, possibly. But for today, we're going to be talking about acid. And first off, what what's that like? You take a tab, you take two tabs, how however many and what's the experience so i'm i'm a i'm a tab guy i think it's largely a very misunderstood experience um to me it's always been kind of this very introspective almost hazy thing um i I, it, it feels good as a way to i would say learn more about yourself rather than to just get fucked up all right. partying it was more of a self looking at yourself look at the man in the mirror i would i would say that for the the first few times i spent far more time being introspective and introverted and within myself totally than i was extroverted with you know two beers in my hand waving them in the air at a party yeah okay can that be dangerous though because i've heard of going down the rabbit hole and for I, some of those who don't know, going down the road, rabbit hole is you dive deep into yourself and you look at death or all those negative thoughts. So go ahead. I would say two things, and I don't want to advocate for being reckless, but I'll say this. There are such things as taking acid, and it, it can be a perspective changer. You can kind of look at things that would be normally very unpleasant for you and unpleasant to think about. You can see them in a different light. You can kind of understand them in some sort of greater context. Um, It can be a tool for a sort of self-realization and a sort of greater understanding of the concepts that scare you. Now, that said, um, if grandma just died, you should probably not trip at the after party to awake. I imagine that might. I, I would say that more direct, immediate trauma and thoughts are probably um, more dangerous to you than just general concepts and fear. But if if you're a person, say you're a person suffering from major depressive disorder, you're in a you know you're in a depressive episode, you're in a depressive state, you aren't happy. It's not going to make you happy. It's not you aren't going to have a good time. In fact, I would tell you that you're probably gonna have an average time for about five hours and then you're not going to be able to sleep and you're going to lay in bed hating yourself for you know having to go to work tomorrow all right and something i forgot to mention before earlier too to add to the ethos which leads into my follow-up but first what's your major here at this Um, university 
I am chemical engineering. I started um, started looking initially at pharmacology, and pharmaceutical studies. Uh, that didn't really fit for me. Yeah, I didn't want to be the guy behind the CVS counter, mm. you know, listening to women yell about their insulin prescriptions. It just wasn't for me. I felt like I was more suited to designing the processes, but I would argue that kind of the clandestine drugs of my, you know, prior youth uh, were the impetus for me wanting to study that. So while you have your own personal experience and firsthand knowledge, you also have some researching background and you've delved into the history slash uh, chemistry behind it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it really did fascinate me when I was very young. When I first took LSD, that was the first psychedelic I tried. Um, and I, 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 I had this trip and I had this very strange time that I wasn't expecting. And I kind of, you know, I woke up the next day, felt like shit. But the day after <laughs> that, I said, Wait, you woke up, it? you were able to fall asleep while on your first trip? Uh, barely for like 30 minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I had like a 12 hour work shift the next day. It was terrible. Oh, it sounds like um, fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, but kind of the day after that, and in the weeks following it, I kind of went down this rabbit hole of reading, checking out books from the library, and just generally wanting to know how was it that something so minuscule in quantity, when we're talking about something that's measured in micrograms, like it's ludicrously po how it could lead me to kind of experience what I would almost describe as a different form of consciousness. It was just a, an, a level of intensity that I hadn't had in my life. It was a life altering experience. And so, yeah, I wanted to know how is this found? Where does it come from? You know, who was the guy? Was it intentional? Was it just, you know, a product of human tinkering and discovery? It was, it was something that did and still very much does interest me. So, yeah. All right. And um, speaking of how it's found, actually, a Dr. Albert Hoffman, if I'm saying that name right. Yes, sir. And what can you tell me about him? There's the brief. He uh, discovered it by accident, actually went into his fingertips, and he felt kind of lightheaded, a little bit queasy sick. So then about the next day, is it? or? So it was he he had, I can't remember what he was trying to synthesize or what he was trying to do. But ostensibly, yes, it absorbed in through his fingertips while he was tinkering with it. And he got on his bike. I believe he was Dutch. I could be wrong about that. You know, please don't quote me Dutch people. Um, <laughs> well, Dutch people bring us on great to the world. I mean, yeah. if so, if so. But adding to the Dutchness, and this is why I think he was Dutch, he rode his bicycle home. And while he was on that bike ride home, he began to trip and he began to feel this kind of this sensation that he'd never felt before. And he got home and he cataloged that he just had the most wonderful, awe-inspiring time of his life. Uh, that day, April 21st, every year, is known as Bicycle Day. Actually, it might be April 19th. A little, uh, little hazy. On I'll do a little quick research to help you out. Fair enough. Thank you much. But please continue. Yeah. And so it kind of grew out of like many things it grew out of countercultural movements it, also i'm a quickly bicycle day april 19th april 19th i knew Indeed. it was one of the two 1943 all right continue oh so <laughs> it, it kind of yeah it, it became part of the american counterculture and the european counterculture uh i would argue that in hindsight it's most closely related to the hippie movements of the 60s <laughs> uh, what's the it, big concert Woodstock? Woodstock, yeah. yeah. There's a there's a pretty famous picture from Woodstock actually of uh hippies on the side of the road and just like, you know, crap ass jeans, uh selling acid for a dollar on the side of the road with this big cardboard sign. I think it's kind of funny. Um and yeah, free love and the grateful dead and peace Hyde not Ash war. Yeah, peace not war <laughs> and you know, people were living in Height Ashbury. There was also the acid tests were going on then, and people were just experiencing what it could do to you and how it could largely alter your perception of art and music. Hmm. 
and kind of bring you to this understanding and kind of this feeling of the music that, you know, is probably best exemplified and, you know, go fucking listen to a Jefferson Airplane album, whatever. <laughs> These guys are fucking crazy. All right. And that, um, that was the whole movement. Obviously, we all know about, well, good to hear. And um, so is that what led into the war on drugs directly after, uh, sometime after, or? I wouldn't say acid so much. Because how did they have this great, loving, peaceful, everybody come together, all this, to even weeds like this devil's lettuce, all that. So where, where was the switch? With acid specifically, um, I don't think it was ever mainstream. I don't think it's ever going to be mainstream. Um, I, I, apparently there's some sort of like resurgence or renaissance occurring in England. I, I have never been to England in my life, so I can't verify that. <laughs> Take that with a grain of salt. But I, it was always kind of viewed as the drug of the counterculture and, you know, the crazy shit that hippies would take to, you know, fuck around and, you know, mm. kill Sharon Tate or whatever. <laughs> it, so it kind of had this bad rap. It's very misunderstood. You know, people always assume that you just swallow this sugar cube of acid or you drop it on your tongue or whatever and just kind of you know, the walls talk to you and Jesus touches you and stuff. And I don't necessarily, maybe that's true for some people, but I don't necessarily know that that's my experience with it. Um, but I think that that's typically what it is stereotyped as in popular culture. What would you say is your typical experience with it? I would say that usually I would take it. Uh, probably about an hour and a half later, it metabolizes very slowly for me. I'm not sure why. If I take it with a group of people, I'm almost always the last person tripping. <laughs> but uh, you you take it and you just slowly, you slowly go through the come up, and you know maybe the walls start breathing, maybe you know people's faces start looking funny. Depends on if how much you've taken, if you're gonna get visuals or not. But generally, you just kind of everything slowly becomes off and strange and for me almost always i feel like this punch in my gut or like this strange almost like you're standing in place during a tidal change at a beach and the water is rushing around you but you're stuck in one place it's a very odd experience to feel you know stationary but also as though you're being pulled in different directions and after a certain point it'll get into your head You'll get to this area of the trip called the peak, and that's where things go wild. That's where you know the patterns on the patterns on blankets start moving and rippling, and you see patterns in the air and things trail and just mm -hmm. generally that's when I would say it's at its most intense. A lot of people really really, really dislike that. I think as I've grown older and as i've taken it more and more uh i've kind of started to see the peak as not necessarily the point of taking mm -hmm. acid by that point i'm usually shut out in my own head uh if i take it at a social function i usually only speak when spoken to i'm doing a lot of thinking <laughs> it's not a great drug to it'd be a great drug to you know take and watch old movies on not necessarily a great drug to take on a bar crawl but what about the whole hippie movement like they go to concerts there that's the most social you could get yeah absolutely i think if you're combining it with you know lots of alcohol and weed <laughs> and you're uh you're a dumb kid or surrounded by other dumb kids and you know you're just trying to get like yeah. everything the grateful dead is playing casey jones directly in front of you and you want to go grab jerry garcia's beard hair then you're probably going to have a different experience than someone like me taking it at a small house party in Connecticut. <laughs> That's a good point. Taking it at a concert is supposedly very wild. That's actually something I've never done. I've also never taken it at the beach is another one I'm frequently recommended. You plan to? I would like to. I, I'd say at this point I've taken enough of it in mundane situations. I might actually take some tonight, depending on um uh, are you on acid on my show right now? I would like to be. That would be that would be probably a mess. Maybe, maybe eventually, but I I think I'd have to work my way up to that. 
being broadcast live to uh, an actual audience of people might not be conducive to the best show you've got. Maybe one day when the podcast goes off in its own segment. Now, another thing I want to bring back to is, well, you kind of mentioned that coming back around to acid or starting to look into it again, people are becoming more lenient with like weed and even acid, I feel like it's starting to get that sort of, it's not the worst thing in the world. The war on drugs has kind of begun to end or it's dying down. And what I'm starting to see a lot is people looking into microdosing. Oh, God. Yeah. You have a different view on this than what I hear typically yeah, see. That, it's a very frustrating thing to me. I, I'll say this. Apparently, and take this with a, a boulder of salt, Bill Gates has endorsed microdosing, said he used to do it back in the day. I don't necessarily know that I believe that shit. That's just something that I get told once every fucking five minutes when I mention acid. I do know Steve Jobs. He did acid, and he said without yeah, acid, he, he wouldn't. He also believed that yogurt would cure his cancer or whatever. Uh. <laughs> he, visionary genius, but uh, maybe all the knives weren't in the drawer. Okay, Bill Gates uh, has defended LSD. Yes. Yeah. I, I would say that it can absolutely be a tool for ideation and for... But what about anxiety or depression? I've seen uh, some reports where it could be. Maybe. I would. It's still in its early stages. That. I will say this. I'm not an advocate of microdosing. I've taken it a few times. I've, I've microdosed a few times. It has never worked out. <laughs> it's always like been... bad trip or just don't do anything. Not necessarily a bad trip. Just enough of a trip to feel uncomfortable in public. <laughs> And like you shouldn't be there, and like you should find a place to be alone. Um, then again, I've also found that I'm taking slightly more than people recommend. But mm -hmm. I, but from my understanding, microdosing is like micro, like in the sense you don't even like feel anything except a little happier or a little like different. Drink a coffee, man. <laughs> Smoke a cigarette. I don't know. <laughs> it's a lot. Uh, there's a lot easier. I would argue safer ways to. <laughs> Get into a peppy mood for your day. All right. Just uh, people look at it as an alternative because, well, for one, we have an opioid epidemic. Yes. But that's a little bit different than what I'm saying when I say a lot of people like to, uh, you have anxiety? Well, here, you have ADD? Take this, uh, take this pill. Or you have depression? Here, take that pill. Or it's like kind of candy. Like in Germany, I'm going to Google this in a second to double check, but I'm pretty sure they hand out like a quarter the amount of pills as we do. I don't know if so it's, it's kind like of a that alternative in a sense. Anymore. I would say that definitely prior to this opioid epidemic, you had a lot of these pharmaceutical companies, you know, Pfizer and Merck, and they would very much advocate. First off, they called OxyContin in particular uh, is the big one. They used to call it non-addictive, non-habit forming, I believe was the term. And they would, <laughs> Opposite. They would yeah, incentivize <laughs> doctors to give it out to patients. And say if you're, say you're a doctor in rural West Virginia, suddenly you're making a lot more money at your practice if for every ache, pain, and sprain you have that some woman has, she can come in and she can get a bottle of 50 milligram OxyContin and you know fade off into oblivion every night and just you know feel on top of the world. I, I, opiates scare me in a way that I think that they don't a lot of people. They seem to be very soul stealing. Okay. I don't necessarily know that any other drug is matched for that. Well, we're in a huge epidemic. The numbers are, yeah. um, you know what? All right, this one's an easier one to look up while I look up my other fact. Uh, opioid, sorry to get on a negative topic, but opioid death numbers in america because it's important to address the facts uh 2017 alone seventy thousand. yeah so yeah it's, that's just yeah. it's ridiculous so uh, even if if there's potential for uh it's still in the early stages but microdosing to kind of help thin out the herd of that maybe because it's not addictive that, acid's not well, addictive or uh, well anything's addictive uh, if yeah. you like i know like, people say weed's not addictive, but I'm pretty sure the set oh, is three out of ten people <laughs> get addicted to, yeah. <laughs> I know people that haven't <laughs> gone 30 minutes without smoking since the fucking 70s. So, yeah, anything's addictive. 
Yeah. The, the, the other thing with acid is your body forms a tolerance to it incredibly rapidly. So I'm very skeptical of the microdosing crap. It, you can look up LSD tolerance calculators. It, your, your body just forms kind of a, a restriction against it so quickly that to regularly or microdose daily might be more on the placebo side than anything else. You might as well be taking pills made of sugar. Placebo has some positive effects too. Yeah. But, but no, I get that. You might as well just take a placebo. I mean, if I told you if I told you that there was acid in this water, there was a minuscule amount of acid in this water and you drank it, would you feel, you know, like one percent better? Yeah. Maybe. Oh yeah, fun fact. This is taken from the Science Versus podcast. But even if you tell somebody it's a placebo and they know it's a placebo and they take a placebo, it can cure some small I believe this that. woman with major IBS tried everything i remember she uh reporting in the podcast and took a placebo knew it was a placebo cured she stopped taking it after like a year back to the old issues so placebo a little sidetrack but yeah it's very powerful very powerful indeed never underestimate it uh fair <laughs> enough never <laughs> underestimate the human mind's ability to rationalize things i guess it's, yeah and speaking of the human mind so getting a little more biology or chemistry whatever you call it how does the brain function on acid or lsd what makes how does what's going on in the brain so i i grew up thinking mechanically the way i've always described it to other people is imagine you're in a house imagine you're in a house and you you go upstairs and you plug in the hair dryer in the bathroom you turn on the washing machine and the dryer you you know, plug in the microwave oven and everything, and you run it all at once. What's going to happen? The master breaker is going to trip. So what you do then, and, and that's basically what happens to your brain. It becomes overstimulated, and you kind of, you, you, you experience odd things. You, you're, the, your breaker is off. You go a little insane for a second. It's basically positive <laughs> psychosis because you've still got, you know, neurotransmitters bouncing around in there and when when you say it like that kind of takes away some of the magic kind of the luster fades away on that one but when you look at just the process itself yes but i mean i don't know that there's truly magic in the world so that's really how it works how i have kind of rationalized it working to myself or imagined it working to myself rather Mm -hmm. and I, not imagined, but when I read when I read literature on it, that's how I process it. Um, so it's not necessarily dangerous if you take it in moderation. If you don't necessarily have any underlying mental condition. Oh yeah, what about the um, what about the you take acid enough and puts holes in your brain? That's a different issue. I mean, I don't know if you take it enough. It not maybe not holes in the brain, but I mean, I'm I'm sure it could wear you out but i mean also the amount you'd have to take would be pretty major i i imagine that if you're having consistently negative effects from your lsd taking it's probably due to the fact that you were predisposed to have something like a mood disorder or a psychotic disorder and taking acid kind of awakens that underlying condition in you there's a lot of stories about t- people you know yeah, they take too many acid and they develop schizophrenia. Well, they didn't develop schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a phys- physiological disorder. What happened was they took it enough times and the schizophrenia that had remained latent came up. And now they hear voices in everyday life. And so it, spe- it speeds up the process. Yes. I remember reading reports like that. I imagine if you're a grieving loved one, it's very easy to point to LSD and say, this would not have happened. If it weren't for this, if it weren't for their bad decision making, and if it weren't for this, then that's a way easier thing to rationalize to yourself other than, fuck, I'm missing out on this person's life because they had this condition we couldn't have known about. So, mm-hmm. so it gets a bad rap in that regard, I would say. All right. I've also seen it have the opposite effect. The Fox of BOX uh, documentary on Netflix, I remember watching a segment on LSD acid. And uh, this person, I forgot what disease it was, but it was terminal. 
Like he knew he was going to die in like a year or something like that. And like any rational person, he was like terrified. Like, but like for him, he was really terrified. Like he was in his house all day. Oh, I'm gonna, like freaking out. The end. He um, he took some LSD. I forgot how many micrograms or how much or how many times he took it. But basically, it kind of got rid of all of his fear. He was able to come to reality. He was able to become in a better mindset. And even when he's off it for here on out, he's in like to the camera. He's just saying, I, I don't know. There's nothing I can do. I'm fine with it. I've accepted it. The end. I, I would say that it can be such a radical experience to so many people. It can be such a world-shifting and world-altering occurrence to experience it. It's it's so much more intense that you can, than you can imagine that it really can put into perspective things you didn't think it would. I, I like to tell friends that it's a great way to figure out all of the problems in your life you didn't know you had and to come up with a plan of action against them. Because you're just so, you, you see the world in a way you don't normally see it. You, you kind of become this other person for a night or a morning, whenever you want to take it. Mm. it. It can be, it can be relieving to a lot of people to the person with terminal illness. I imagine that, you know, maybe he examined his mortality. Maybe he said, well, I had a good one. Uh, maybe in other situations, it would do the opposite. I don't know. It depends on the person. Because again, we're all different people. We all have different mindsets. Um, and like earlier, before you said it can, anything could either give you a beat. I know people who are like, think they're completely fine or something. They take acid and then boom, like a small thing they don't know creeps up, hits them in the back of the head oh, like yeah. a baseball bat. And they're, uh, like, well, I don't want to say the name, but even this kid a week ago, same thing. Like, I don't know. It can just, you don't know. You oh, don't know. I know who you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think, uh, yeah, I think I've got a few good, I've actually got a really good few stories about stuff like Please that. Please share. I, I'd like to share a few anecdotes just to get delve specifically into stuff. I probably should have explained or given these out earlier when. I explained what it was like to trip. Um, I, I do distinctly remember bicycle day of last year. I was living on campus. I was alone. I decided to take it and kind of go for a walk through campus. It was raining a little bit. I didn't care. I was happy as a clam. Daytime, nighttime? Nighttime. Uh, I remember the campus was cleared out for some reason. And it was... It's miraculous. Once you get a mile away from your house and suddenly you don't remember how to get back, it's really easy to remember that you had a paper due the next day. Or you have other priorities to be doing than, you know, this stupid thing. It, you know, it, and then you go home and you write out your essay on a complex linear theory algebra yeah. while you're tripping out of your ball, yeah, like, tripping oh, out of your fuck, mouth. Oh, fuck, oh, fuck. <laughs> I hope this makes any sense. I knew a guy, actually, this is kind of interesting. UConn student currently, uh, if he hears this, you know, I'm sure he'll say something to me. He'd probably <laughs> laugh that it was getting said on air. Um, I knew a guy uh, at my old job who took acid before he took the SAT. This was <laughs> verified to me many times by outside sources. Oh, I got would, that 1600 perfect, right? He did very, very well. This was Wait. before they switched to the 1600 score. Okay. I so out 2,200? 2,400? 2,400? That sounds right. Uh, either way, I know he scored an almost almost perfect score. He was, but that said, this guy was also, you know, borderline genius level. He's absolutely brilliant. He just, he said, hey, this is my second time taking the SAT. Might as well. And, um, you know, knocked it out of the park for whatever reason on acid. You know, it just allowed him to get into the zone I, re I do distinctly remember him telling me that uh the staple in <laughs> one of the papers on his desk crawled away <laughs> while God. he was taking it well, but no. psychologically pe smart people do tend to go towards drugs but like that's like yeah on acid i think it's more of a curiosity there's also the story of that guy 
I can't remember who it was. There was some major league baseball pitcher forever ago who took a hit of acid and pitched a no hitter. <laughs> he didn't know he was, he thought he was second stringing it that day or something. And the guy got hurt and he just, you know, played the best game of his life. <laughs> Does that count as cheating? Is that juicing? Is that steroids? Yeah. Like, <laughs> this was also back in the day where, you know, Barry Bonds and Sammy Sosa were fucking cranking them shit. So I'm sure that. <laughs> well, they that were juicing. Yeah, that wasn't yeah. the main priority, a little hit of acid in one game. God damn. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, but I feel like I cut you off earlier, then we sidetracked. You're telling your little uh, you're telling your story about going for a walk. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe not that specific one. Uh that one's not too interesting. I do have one that is pretty funny. Mm. Uh basically when I was a younger a younger person, I was a little wilder. Uh, I had a little less experience under my belt, a little less perspective, did stupid things all the time. My second time taking acid, the first time I'd taken one hit, second time I decided to take two hits. My friend's house, his mom was a psych nurse. She worked nights. And Also, so, quick question, how many milligrams in each hit? Oh, I wouldn't know. This was no. back before I oh, just know, was getting it from people who would even tell me this. It's like <laughs> a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend. Uh, and so basically. I, I remember taking it in his bathroom, not telling him that I was about to take acid. And then about an hour after I took it, his mom calls, calls the house and says, hey, uh, they're letting me off from it. I'm going to come back home. Um, I know it's really late. Do you do you want to go like have me cook dinner or something like, you know, do you want to just like spend time as a family? And by this time I was I was. Not into the trip, but I was starting to get worried that this woman was going to come home. I kind of freaked out a bit. I knew we had about 45 minutes. And she had a calendar that was two dice and a little plaque. And the plaque would tell you the month. Each of the dice was, you know, six-sided dice. And so basically you could orient the dice in such a way to display the date. And I remember going, oh, the date's up. So I walk over to it. I grab the dice, I start looking through them in my hand, spinning them around, spinning them around, trying to find a five. And suddenly, every number on the dice, on each of the dice, was two. <laughs> and uh, then his mom called again and said, hey, I'm about five minutes out. You want me to grab anything? And so I threw my friend my keys and said, get me the fuck out of your house. <laughs> and so we drove, around, we drove around back roads. I remember we went into Hartford. Your friend just, drove or you drove all on drove. acid? Oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not that reckless. Not even at the time. Uh, I just remember like the world stretching out in front of me. It just looked like I was in a video game. It looked like I was in Star Trek and, you know, we were engaging light speed or actually to be more accurate to say it looked like I was in space balls. And we were going plaid on the outside of the windows. It was just a it was a crazy experience. I'd never been moving that fast on acid before i never really had that you know desire to don't know that i would have it again it was a little intense for my taste i'm uh i'm more of a sit around and lay on the floor and listen to Jimi hendrix uh later that same night actually i ended up going to a lake standing on a lifeguard chair and raising my hands up and watching pillars of water come out of the lake oh my like you're moses yeah you know, literally like i was <laughs> moses parting the red sea and I, I think that my friend and his sister who are with me were just absolutely exasperated. Probably wasn't as cool to them to watch their dumbass friend. This kid tripping on acid. Like, oh, <laughs> oh, I'm going to save the Jews. I'm going to save the Jews. <laughs> um, I've had that one. The first time I ever took it, I cataloged it. And I was home alone, had a pen and paper in my hand. And I said, well, I don't necessarily know that I'm going to remember this. I knew nothing about acid. I was about 16 years old. Uh, I, I had basically thought to myself, if I don't remember this, I want to at least have a perspective on what I was feeling at the time so that if I ever take it again or if I want to explain it to someone, I can do that. And so I, I started writing, you know, 8 o'clock p.m., nothing yet. 9 o'clock p.m., nothing yet. And at some point in the night, after I had started tripping and just losing my mind, I remember believing to myself that the devil 
was behind my closet door and that I really didn't want to open that door because if I did, Satan himself was just going to be there going, hey there. That's um, pretty opposite to that little DMT story you told me where oh, you saw yeah. God's hand. Yeah, so uh, for the audience, I did try DMT once. It's not necessarily an experience I would recommend. I, I'm too cynical. I'm not a, not a religious person, not a spiritual person. So I don't, I think that that's probably the target audience for it. Anyway, took a few hits of DMT out of a bowl. Um, was sitting in my kitchen, turned around and watched the ceiling kind of rip as those, as though I was like inside of a box and packing tape was getting cut and a box was about to be opened. And God's hand just kind of reached straight into my living room and started feeling around for my furniture and shit. And his hand was patterned with like peacock feathers and weird things that just kind of shifted in space. He, he grabbed your couch and your TV. And yeah, then when the trip ended, everything around. was gone. He got a little gropey. God, <laughs> God really wanted to feel up my furniture. I don't know why. I, I think I was so jaded, though. I was just like, ah, this ain't doing it for me. <laughs> I don't believe there's God, God. God's hand cut. Well, yeah, like not today, yeah. God. You don't think so, but like yeah. still in the moment, you're seeing this hand come down. It was. You're like, I'm gonna go get some water. Or yeah, something. pretty yeah. much. I I felt pretty done, and then I think it did not last very long for me at all. I think after that, I ended up trying trying I to think, go. Maybe a cold shower will make me feel better. I think it only lasts like 15 minutes on average, or something. Oh, not even. That. It was like five for me. I literally saw that for about 30 seconds. I felt kind of like floored for a bit, and then I just somehow managed to crawl up my stairs into my shower and i was like cold water will get me feeling right took off all my clothes forgot to take off my socks <laughs> took a full shower <laughs> generally it was not the best experience i don't know that i'm the greatest advocate for dmt even though you can you know like make it yourself in your kitchen or whatever all right uh some other episode i definitely plan to talk more about dmt because that's very interesting there's a whole lot to it right. but I'd like for to try it again at some point yeah go, come in um Come take a seat. I'll we'll talk. Then you rip it. Then I'll start talking, and then like come back and be like, "So yeah, blast it off to this, this, that." Yeah, looking at the <laughs> sprinklers around this room, I imagine we'd have to cover the smoke detector up. But uh, uh, that might be a a podcast experience that these people wouldn't soon forget. <laughs> Get Joe Rogan to do it too. He's always talking about that stuff. Oh, absolutely, I'm sure he. I'm sure he'd love to call in from beauty, so beautiful, sunny California to come on some <laughs> college students podcast and take dmt yeah back. um yeah joe rogan that one chance you're hearing <laughs> throw a little like a little feature this is a <laughs> this is a shout out can anybody in the audience get joe rogan to come on this podcast we'll let we'll uh we'll feature some on it project products we'll you know shill for it yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh speaking my god of, speaking of joe rogan quick tangent if they cancel tony versus khabib i'm gonna lose my mind this coronavirus thing has me losing it. I, I want to see that fight. You know, coronavirus can take the whole world, but better not cancel it. Anyway, if they both back have to it. drugs. All right, yeah, bring it back to acid, LSD. Um, what were we talking about briefly? And then, and then I said, uh, you're telling about a trip you had, the first trip, and then you wrote down everything. Yeah, I believe the devil. So what was the main, well, yeah, yeah. So what's the main takeaway? So somebody who's going to try acid, they, uh, don't know what's going in for and like everybody says the same like oh it's uh you can't explain it you can't explain it or nothing but from your writing down oh, or the best knowledge you can yeah i give you best so uh, what what happened to me and i i say this in hindsight it's easier to explain because i've literally been able to read through the stupid fucking notes the whole time i felt like kind of like i was on a very weak roller coaster physically the whole time I was seeing crazy shit but mostly for me it was mental I had nothing to do except, you know, sit around, scratch my dog's head, and try and do things that I would normally do not on acid while on acid. Um, so I couldn't really read. I tried to read Moby Dick. Couldn't really get through Moby Dick. Uh, couldn't concentrate or like the page very, was weird or it's a very verbose novel. Um had to read not, that in high school, didn't you? That's why you had to read it? No, I just I Oh you just, just felt like picking up? All right. Book. Anyway, continue. continue. Uh, <laughs> anyway, it's not necessarily the best trip literature. Uh, I tried to watch TV. It bored me. Uh, tried to play play some instruments, uh, some piano. Uh, not a not a great pianist on acid. I was thinking I was gonna, you know, write some sonata. 
Yeah, gonna it's a Mozart. Part of me. Did not. But what was interesting was it kind of allowed me to see into myself and kind of, it almost felt like play with my own brain and make it do different things. And I, I kind of had the willpower to, I was like, well, what if I had talked to myself, but I talked to myself for real? And so I, I was like, all right, I'm going to, you know, split my brain and I'm going to talk to different facets of my personality. And so I wrote this dialogue out as it kind of came to me. It felt like different people were talking with me and different people were having different discussions with me at the same time. It felt like I was talking to myself. It felt like I was talking to several different parts of myself. You know, we all had a, a very deep conversation about who I am, what it is to be me. Uh, so it's like you're sitting in a room with chairs around, like maybe in like that kind movie of, kind of theory, or is in it? In my own head, kind of. I, or was it like you ever see Split? Not necessarily. It wasn't like, oh, people are taking me over. It was, <laughs> it was more like I just kind of sat there. I felt like the middleman between, I felt like the stenographer in a courtroom. <laughs> it was interesting to listen to the drama play out, listen to the different parts of myself bounce off each other. I felt like I actually got to, by kind of personifying different things, you know, maybe my apprehension, my desire to be funny, my desire to be extroverted, of, uh, you know, the, parts of me that were weren't necessarily things i normally consider my my judgment by doing that i felt like i was able to kind of learn how my own brain communicated with my with itself and learn how my thought process actually works it, it was odd it was kind of illustrated to me that was my first trip and one i would you know i look back on very fondly as something that kind of open something up in me as being, you know, ridiculously intense. I didn't necessarily need insane visuals to do that. Um, what was also great about that was I had my dog next to me. And I mean, <laughs> let me tell you, man, uh, it's man's best friend for a reason. There's nothing like just sitting down there, losing your, losing your dome on acid, and scratching your little guy's head. I, I feel like you can't have a bad trip if you have a dog with you just oh, absolutely. chilling. <laughs> All happy and peaceful and smiling. It was great. Yeah, like, I, don't, I don't know what's going on, but I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm here. Yeah. So what do you say? I mean, I feel like I know the answer. You kind of just said it. But what do you say it kind of changed your, I don't want to say personal. It kind of changed you from there on out or yes. had you, yeah. Yes, in a way that I didn't necessarily know how to adjust to at first. I, I would caution against this i felt honestly it had shifted my identity in some direction that i couldn't really understand but i needed to advocate for acid now i needed to be someone who wore it on their sleeve it was this experience that changed me it was that it was this thing that blew me away and made me feel adventurous made me feel unique and so i almost kind of for a while incorporated it into who i thought i was which was odd and i would argue that you know uh, i imagine in hindsight people are going to look back at me as uh that crazy kid who probably almost burned out <laughs> but at the time it felt rebellious felt like i was going against the status quo so it, i would argue it did change me it's definitely softened now into just a pastime a hobby of mine but hmm. not necessarily something i you know, would like to do all the time, you know, talk about with every person I meet. <laughs> I got you. All right. Good story. Um, I think that's a good point to cut it off. All right. Yeah. Um, thanks for coming out. Thanks for coming on the show and spreading your knowledge. Is there anything you'd like to say for the audience? Anything that's not anything false that you want to fix or any message you want to deliver? Yes, actually, I would like to say something. Test your shit. If you're going to take acid and, you know, I encourage you to do it if it's something that you've been thinking about doing, you're in a great headspace, maybe you have someone who is offering to trip sit you, to babysit you, to make sure you don't go off the rails, to just make sure you have a grounded, positive, happy, wholesome time, as wholesome as hallucinogenic drugs could be. All right, very good. Buy, buy a test kit. I'm and, actually Googling one while uh, yes. you're talking, 20 Ehr bucks. Ehrlich's region. Or reagent. Test your shit. Make sure it's not 
end bomb or something that's not what your plug says it is. That can lead to nerve system damage. You really don't want to do that to yourself. It kills people. That's my that's my final words. My uh, you know aware. All right. I feel like that's a very powerful, accurate thing, like you said. And um, one of the big issues, or one of the big preventions about the war on drugs, or a lot of those issues where they try and get all right, you try and get rid of something like a drug or something. It always finds its way on the market. People are always buying it, but then it becomes lace or something, or you get these flaws and shit. Oh, if it becomes more accept- acceptable and you're able to, you know, play it safe, with, test it with tolerance and understanding, will come safety. I don't know that it'll ever reach that level. It's a very intense thing. It's almost a spiritual thing to some people. I don't necessarily know that it's quite ready to break into the popular conscience yet. I think it's going to remain a countercultural thing for at least a few years. Yeah. I have some optimism for a long run. I mean, look at I weed even. So. Yeah. yeah, shrooms are kind of coming around. I know, I believe it's the city of Denver decriminalized them. Um, hmm. Maybe the whole state of California. Um, don't take my word for that if you're, you know, or not California, Colorado. Colorado. They're first um, with everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think they're just the people that like to, you know, go hiking and get fucked up. <laughs> with their Subarus. With their Subarus. <laughs> Lesbians and Subarus. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thanks again. Thank you very much for coming out, sparing a lot of knowledge. Hope to see you again. We'll address different topics from DMT or anything. All right. We'll figure that out in the future. One more time. This is The Way Podcast. You can uh, send email podcast the way at gmail.com. Find me on Anchor. I'm also available on Spotify, iTunes, literally nine, ten different, like everything. So, um, yeah, podcast the way. Thank you very much. And WHUS 91.7, top of the hour, uh, Stores, Connecticut. Not saying, not saying goodnight, just saying. Just saying. Oh, just a little thumbs up. Yeah. Little thumbs up. Try acid. Try acid. <laughs>